Well, well, welcome to Lab Life with the Air Force Research Laboratory. Hi, I'm Michelle. And I'm Kenneth. Today, we're sitting down with Carrie Ann Hobbs, who's a rocket scientist for the Air Force Research Laboratory. She's a marathon runner who worked on a system that prevents jets from colliding with the ground and can't wait to see a Martian sunset. In three, two, one. Carrie Ann, welcome to Lab Life. Thank you. Thanks for, for inviting me. I'm excited to kind of help you guys kick this, kick this off. We're excited to have you too. Uh, what we really want to know is what does a rocket scientist do? So a rocket scientist is really a colloquial name for an aerospace engineer. Now, aerospace engineers can work in aeronautics or they can work in astronautics and they can design or build or test or evaluate um, a variety of different aircraft and, and spacecraft. But there's a ton of disciplines that go into it. So even though you say rocket science, um, most people maybe think propulsion, but a lot of times, you know, they could be doing any kind of aspect of designing an aircraft or, or a spacecraft. So which one of those two paths do you do? So that's a good question. So by education, I actually have a little bit more of an astronautics background with more spacecraft. Uh, but pretty much all of my jobs that I've had have been in the aircraft domain. So um, I actually have a, my undergrad is aerospace and I did a concentration in astronautics. So basically the difference there is that where I went to school, about six classes between the aeronautics and astronautics that you take that are going to be more, you know, spacecraft propulsion instead of air breathing engine propulsion, those types of things. And then I did my master's in astronautics, uh, astronautical engineering. And then I've been working on my PhD technically in aerospace, but at that point you kind of also pick a concentration. And so mine is in controls engineering. Very nice. Um, so uh, kind of stepping it back a little bit, there's a, a common phrase that kind of tags along with rocket scientists. So um, we're kind of wondering that, you know, most people say, well, it's not rocket science. Uh, what do you guys say when something's uh, difficult or you're having a, a tough task you need to solve? Um, so sometimes, you know, we will say, well, it's not rocket science. If it was, I'd understand it. <laughs> um, and then I think, you know, you also have the, the idea of, uh, of brain surgery. Well, it's good to know. A lot of people, um, I've heard joke about that before, and I've never actually asked a rocket scientist, so I appreciate you clearing that up for us. So could you tell us more about uh, your schoolwork you're doing as a rocket scientist? I know you're currently pursuing your PhD at Georgia Tech, and what does that involve? Okay. For education-wise, you know, a lot you can, you can start as an aerospace engineer with just a bachelor's degree. Um, but usually if you want to do any kind of leadership, you need to get a master's degree. And if you're interested in doing research or leading teams of researchers, then you really need a PhD. So I'm in the kind of PhD phase now. Uh, and what's involved in that is that essentially you have a, a series of coursework that you have to complete. And then once you finish your coursework, you have a qualifying exam. And I can talk more about that if you're interested. And then once you take this qualifying exam, if you pass, you have to propose research and then you conduct research. And it's kind of this hazy thing with a PhD. Uh, for the other degrees, to some degree, once you finish your coursework, you have these certain number of classes you take, you get your degree. But when it comes to a PhD, you graduate when you have made a contribution to the field in your research. And that's kind of a hazy thing. So it could be anywhere from maybe three years is pretty, pretty aggressive, or you know, some people take seven or, or even longer years to, to finish a PhD, because it really is about that research phase at the end. Do you have any inkling of what you want to do for your research? Where I'm at right now, so I finished all my coursework, and I actually was very fortunate to do that through a long-term full-time training program at the Air Force. So the Air Force sent me uh, for a year to get coursework to get better at my job at Georgia Tech. And, and then after that, came back and studied on my nights and weekends for uh, about seven months and then went back and took my qualifying exam. And then I've been working with my advisor doing research and so I proposed my research uh, back in December. And my topic is actually looking at how you're gonna do collision avoidance for spacecraft in a verified rigorous way. Um, and I'm looking at a very specific class of spacecraft maneuvers and I'm looking at can you use a set of trajectories and be able to decide between them on, on board versus trying to create a very specific maneuver for that scenario to kind of help speed it up. Because when it comes to spacecraft, the computing that's on there is gonna be way older than what you have on your computer because it has to be rad hardened, it has to be able to survive the vibration environment on launch, it has to be able to survive a lot of things. So you've got limited memory and limited processing power. So you wanna be able to, to design a maneuver set you can actually upload on that computer equipment and also the other big challenge is to verify it's not gonna do something wrong, like accidentally collide with something because it's trying to maneuver to avoid something that's not there. 
So how do you add that rigor in? Wow. With those devices then, so uh, kind of digging deeper, once you send them up and you have um, all the hardware set, is there ways you can still upload new software or is it pretty, once it's up there, it's untouched? So it's not completely my expertise area, so I don't want to dive too, I, I know that you can upload some um, changes to the software. Of course you can't change the hardware, and so once start th things start failing, then you have to adapt to that, because you can't, can't go up and change it, versus the aircraft, when it's down on the ground, you can swap things in and out, right? So you can do some modifications uh, to software while it's up there, but I'm mostly looking at this kind of from a, what we call basic research. So I'm thinking about if we were design a new type of spacecraft, and we want to have it have a collision avoidance system that's very rigorous, uh, and can deal with a lot of contingency situations, then how might you do that kind of if you started back at the drawing board? So the technology, a lot of times that we work on in basic research in the Air Force, it might go on to something in sometimes maybe 20 years from now. Maybe, maybe sooner. Absolutely. I mean, I'm thinking about all the future space movies that wouldn't happen because there would be no disasters because you've designed this software <laughs> to make sure they don't, you know, collide with an yeah. <laughs> asteroid or a piece of space junk. That, mm -hmm. that sounds fascinating. Well, you did touch on that you're pursuing your PhD while being employed by the Air Force. How has the Air Force helped you accomplish that? Well, I think, first of all, I think being able to get to the stage that I'm at now wouldn't have been possible without the Air Force. So I started off uh, as an undergrad student, I had to take out some student loans. So as I was graduating, I was like, I don't know if I can go straight to you know, a master's degree or other graduate school program because I had my student loans were like, I think it was a 9.75% interest rate. So factor in, if I wanted to go to that PhD and it did take me seven years, then that was gonna be a kind of a non-starter. So uh, I ended up coming straight out of undergrad to AFRL. And I'm really fortunate being here at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base that there's multiple universities in the area. And, I, and one of them is AFIT, the Air Force Institute of Technology, which is right here at wright Pat, And it's only about a 10 to 15 minute walk from my office. Great. So I actually did my master's um, one class at a time at AFIT by walking there. And as a Air Force civilian, the, the classes were free. So I basically used that as my lunch hour to do my master's. Uh, and then when it came to the PhD, I was looking at the different opportunities and really one of the reasons I picked Georgia Tech was because of their program. Uh, not only do they have a professor there that's really good in an area called formal methods, which is kind of this mathematical basis to kind of do proofs of a control system. It's very hard to find an aerospace department, uh, but they have a lot of systems engineering and kind of safety engineering courses that I couldn't find other places. So I was able to go there for a year and really get much better at my job by studying a lot of these different topics that I maybe wasn't available locally. The other thing that's been great is be, I basically, right now, one of the things that I work on is a, a lab task through AFOSR. So the job basically is to do research uh, and it's to do very basic research and publish papers, which is the same type of work that you need to do for a PhD. So I'm kind of able to to do both and I'm still putting in like, you know, good good amount of hours and everything on it, on it but it, it definitely helps to be able to use part of my job to do that research to help me earn that PhD. Great, so working with the Air Force Office of Scientific mm -hmm. Research mm -hmm. is awesome. So kind of speaking of um, doing research and working with rocket science, more of the umbrella term, uh, a lot of people, possibly our fans, uh, would like to know um, a lot more about, you know, missions to Mars and further. Um, so given the chance, uh, would you ever uh, go to space, even just to the International Space Station and beyond? Oh yeah, definitely. I think I've wanted to be, I think a lot of aerospace engineers go into go into it because they want to be an astronaut. And that's been my dream since I was six years old. So my family went on a trip to the Johnson Space Center, or Space Center Houston, and I walked out of there at six and said, this is what I want to do. I want to be an astronaut. You know, it changed your life. It changed my life. It put me on a different trajectory. And so now it's kind of funny because um, anybody even who knew me in elementary school and they find out, you know, I'm an aerospace engineer and I'm pursuing a PhD, they're like, oh, that makes sense. I can see that. It's always what she wanted to do. Um, but definitely, I think um, at this stage, Every time that the astronaut application comes up, which has only actually been once since I've been eligible for it, I plan to apply. And so I did apply the first time along with 18,000 of my closest friends. Oh, wow. <laughs> right? So very, very competitive process. But it's definitely something I'm interested in. I would be interested in going to Mars. I'd be interested in going to the National Space Station. So I'm one of those crazy people that is not, not as, as scared of, of the idea of all of the challenges that going to Mars would, would bring. See, that's really cool. Um, so speaking of, let's say you had to go to Mars mm -hmm. and you can only see one uh, major, like let's say 
geological structure, a cool thing on Mars, like Olympus Mons, the Great Canyons, like what would you see if you could have one, like let's say stop just for you? The one thing that I would really wanna see actually is maybe not a, uh, not necessarily a geographic formation, but I would really wanna see a Martian sunset. Oh, that'd be cool. Because I've heard it's blue. And there's been some pictures that come out and it looks kind of blue, which it's just kind of cool to me that you know we're on a blue planet and we have a red sunset and this is a red planet with a blue sunset. And I think that would be what I would want to see the most. And if you put that in Instagram, I mean, the amount of hits you can get. Right. <laughs> That'd be pretty amazing. <laughs> like the other thing that I would want to see is I'd want to see Earth in the night sky. Absolutely. Oh, wow. That'd be sweet. And um, kind of touching back on what you mentioned earlier then, so it's a pretty rigorous process to be vetted to be an astronaut. Um, do you know what exactly goes into that? Or at least what, like, did they talk to you last time? Like, hey, you didn't make it this time. This is what you should do uh, to get along further. I wish they gave me, you know, something more than I heard. They used to send out postcard rejections to people who applied, but I did only got an electronic one, and it was just, sorry, you didn't make it. So in order to apply, you need to have at least a bachelor's degree in, in engineering or biological science um, or some kind of physical science, computer science or mathematics. And then you need either three years of experience or you could potentially have a PhD. But there's other things that are on there that, that help. So they'd like to see pilot experience. And so even though I haven't finished my pilot's license, I put my, my few hours that I had on there. But I guess if you have a thousand hours of jet experience and that really helps, I don't know that I will ever have that. but. I think it also, I've heard that it helps if you have any kind of medical background, if you have geology experience, and I know people who have volunteered with USGS to kind of get that experience. Uh, I know people who have gone and done scuba certification, because that apparently helps on there. And then I think the other big thing is just staying very physically active. So for me, I started running half marathons and marathons to be able to, to give myself a goal to continue to stay very physically active. And so I set a goal to run 50 of them, one in every state, because I figure it'll take me a while to finish that, and then it keeps me running. Kind of a lot that goes into it, but those are some of the things to think about, I guess. Wow. Running to get to space, that's a new one. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. pretty awesome. So it sounds like you really are trying to make yourself competitive. Yes. So next time around, you're going to be ready for it. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to get that Instagram shot of the, the blue sunset. That would be, that would be I'm great. waiting for it the yeah. second it happens. Cause, cause we follow you on Instagram, <laughs> at Rocket Sci Barbie, and we've noticed that you have a fascinating um, collection of photos and drawings that you do. Mm -hmm. We've we watched some um, kind of time motion captures of you drawing ideas around physics and flying. Could you talk to us about that a little? Um, one of the things that I found out as I was doing my PhD especially is that to deal with the stress, because when I was doing the PhD to do my coursework, I had to take four or five classes a semester, which doesn't sound like a lot, but in grad school, most people take two. I tried to make it a little bit more fun by actually drawing some of the, the lectures and making it more interesting. And then as I was going through my notes, I was like, these are really kind of cool. I wonder what I could do with this. And so I've been slowly redrawing parts of them and doing those kind of time capture drawings that I've been posting online. But I also found, uh, I started painting again, and that was a really good way to kind of relax and, and to, to kind of become centered again when I was spending so much time studying. Uh, to do something, use the other side of my brain versus the logical side. Uh, so some of the stuff that's up there, I think, are some drawings and paintings, paintings from that. And I think one of those paintings that's up there is of a, a Martian, blue Martian sunset. Oh, nice. <laughs> and that's something that I think a lot of, um, at least engineers, I come from an engineering family, may struggle with. So how do you stay on top of time management when you're in school doing work and a multitude of other things? So it's kind of funny because I've had people ask me, how do you do it all? And, and honestly, I kind of run an optimization algorithm all the time in my brain. And I will just not go do something if it's going to take a certain amount of time. There's a cost associated with everything, every activity that you do. And there's a reward associated with everything that you do. And so I basically have that constantly running. So I'm like, okay, well, how long is this activity going to take? You know, what, what am I going to get out of it? A lot of things I think of as being very productive. I, I see things like, you know, I have to go exercise. If I set a, a goal to run a marathon, then I know I have a certain amount I need to do. It helps me to stay relaxed. It helps me to prepare for, for whatever goal or race that I have coming up. I make sure that if I'm going to the grocery store, I'm going on the way to something or on the way back from something to kind of save that time. So it's very much a constantly trying to figure out, okay, what do I do when? How much time does everything take? How do I schedule it all for maximum efficiency? <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, you know, you have this algorithm to see what will give you the most reward. So mm -hmm. just touch on that a little bit. 
work is a big part of your life still. Mm -hmm. So what is one of the most rewarding things that you've had the opportunity to work on in your career? I think one of the more rewarding projects that I've done and what's actually kind of come to influence my PhD research in doing collision avoidance was the automatic air and ground collision avoidance systems that AFRL developed. So I hit the first pro project lottery when I, when I started at AFRL. So here I come straight out of undergrad. I'm working in a simulation branch where we're simulating a lot of different uh, automated technologies from automated aerial refueling to, in particular, the automated ground collision avoidance system. So I initially started off as just kind of helping to put some of that technology that was being developed into our simulators so that pilots could come in and evaluate it. And I found it really interesting and asked if I could get more involved. And I ended up kind of taking on different parts of it from evaluating the documents that came back, actually helping to write some of the requirements, analyzing the requirements, going out to flight test and watching them flight test it, getting to then sit in on some of these meetings where they're making these design decisions, especially in the air collision avoidance system. Are we going to have both both aircraft running algorithm? Are we, you know, is it going to be a one chip design? How are we going to make these big conceptual design decisions on it? And so what's what this program actually did, uh, there was a couple of different phases. The first one was a ground collision avoidance system. And uh, basically it's it's designed for for fighter aircraft. Initially one was, the, the first one they put it on was the F-16. And what it does is it has a digital map on board and it compares kind of where the state of the aircraft is. So where is it going? Where is it at? How fast is it going? What angle is it at? Those types of things to this digital terrain map. And it projects this maneuver out in front of it. And so this maneuver is a roll to wings level. So if, you, if you're inverted, you're upside down, it'll roll you to wings level first. And then it does a 5G pull maneuver to pull the aircraft away. So it's projecting this maneuver that kind of looks like a kind of a line and an arc out in front of the airplane against this map. And if they detect that a collision is going to happen, this 3D map that's got basically these pinpoints of like what the, how high the terrain is at different points, and then it will engage the maneuver and it will pull the aircraft up and save the pilot. And the reason that they did this is because there's a, it's kind of a category that depends on how you categorize it, but there's this class of, of accidents called controlled flight into terrain. And there's also gravity-induced loss of consciousness, or G-lock, that sometimes is, is included in, sometimes not. There's a variety of circumstances where the, something happens with the pilot, but the aircraft should be in good shape, and it causes it to collide. And so one of those is that gravity-induced loss of consciousness. So you're in a highly capable aircraft, and you pull nine Gs or more, the blood drains out of your head, you pass out, or you black out, and the system would... It doesn't detect that necessarily physiological, but it detects that the aircraft's on a collision course and will correct. And there's also pilots sometimes will get fixated on a task they're trying to do, or they're being asked to do so many things in the aircraft beyond just trying to fly it. So if they're, they're doing all these things, they're becoming saturated with the amount of tasks they're having to do, becoming distracted. And they had tried putting manual warning systems on that would kind of you know, give them a, a, an audible altitude, altitude, pull up kind of thing, or it would actually flash um, different warnings, but they were so focused on what they were doing or so distracted that they would miss these warnings. And so they decided that you needed really an automated solution for this. So this is the IOG cast solution was the, the first of the technology areas. And really, it was almost 25 years in the making. It was uh, several different programs that AFRL has done, and they worked with NASA on a lot of them as well. And it really kind of came down to certain technology being available. And I think one of the big things that happened was in 2000, they did a space shuttle mission. And they did radar topography of the Earth, and that's some of the data that they're using to get this 3D map to do the collision predictions. And then the other program is the automatic air collision avoidance system. And so it's looking at two aircraft that are on some kind of trajectory where they're going to collide, and then they have a series of different maneuvers that they can select from to be able to automatically uh, avoid. And so both of these have been flight tested the, and, and developed to a pretty high TRL level or technology readiness level. <laughs> and so the, the auto GCAS, the ground one, was deployed on all the F-16s that have digital flight control computers, so anything that's been built pretty much after 1988, so like since I've been alive. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, so that's, it's on all of those as of 2014. And since then, it's been credited with saving seven pilots and aircraft, which is a pretty cool thing to kind of be early in in your career and you get to see this go out and then start to really make a difference. And to some degree, it's inspired me to continue to work 
in this area of kind of how do we make these you know, automated systems, how do we do these backup safety systems, and how do we do them in a rigorous and safe way? That's amazing work. I mean, making sure you know our our pilots, our airmen, get to go home at night to their families and um, continue doing great work. That's fantastic, mm -hmm. and and keeping keeping those planes flying a, as well, keeping everyone safe so there's not a major accident. That's yeah. amazing work. Yeah, and it's amazing to see how many how much goes into that. The different groups that are involved from. You know, for us, we were working with a, a prime contractor, so one of the big DOD companies, and then we were also working with NASA, and we were working with the Flight Test Center through the whole program, and just the number of people that are involved to make something like that happen. Actually seeing the pilots, um, seeing how they evolved from saying, I don't know if I want something that's gonna take control of my airplane, to is this gonna be on my airplane? Right. You know, it's a very big transformation, too, to see that. Or even uh, we worked with the, the human factors folks here, and they studied how is this being taught? I guess how are they how are they deploying it? How are they teaching the pilots that this is what's going to be on your your aircraft? And here's how it works. And and how do you feel about this being on your airplane? And they were even finding I think that, that some of the wives of the pilots are saying, is this on my on my husband's airplane? So it's kind of pretty cool. Or I, I had a really I've had some cool experiences too because there's I forget exactly how many, but there's more than 20 different countries that fly F-16s. And so early in the program, we were looking for an international partner, and I got to brief this at Hill Air Force Base at the System Safety Group meeting for F-16s. And it was just really interesting to even hear people there coming up to me and asking, you know, about how far along was it? I mean, not super, super technical, but, you know, kind of trying to figure out, okay, how can we set up some discussions to potentially put this on other so as these continue then, are they going to be tapping into your talent to travel to these countries later on to help? Or is this something you said you're more of just observing from here and helping brief people here in the States? Yeah, so I officially, uh, so I worked that program from 2011 to 2014. And then at the end of 2014, I ended up moving into more of a basic research position because I wanted to do more technical things. So I wouldn't necessarily be involved in that, but I know that they have, they continue to participate in some of these these meetings to let them know kind of where the technology's at. Still, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, kind of touching on the technical side of this then, um, I don't know if you uh, kind of spoke on it earlier, but in terms of the um, auto, the air avoidance, like two craft, they mm -hmm. both have to have the software um, on the aircraft themselves to know how to maneuver out of the way, or is only one needed and they can detect another moving body and just go past so it? So that's a great question. Um, and so the way that that works is that you can have two aircraft. Um, we call that a cooperative case, where you have both aircraft, maybe you're both in a training mission and you're maneuvering, you're doing these very complex basic fighter maneuvers or combat uh, maneuvers, and you are able to essentially communicate via data link where you're at, and they get very good information, and so you can get pretty close. And it Because the idea with these systems is that, one, first, they should do no harm, so they shouldn't do anything to actually cause harm to the, the pilot or the aircraft. Two, they shouldn't interfere, so they should be able to, to fly in the canyon, they should be able to, to do their basic maneuvers without it turning on, and then it should prevent the collision. So if you have a cooperative scenario, then you can get a little bit closer to each other, but there's other ways you could detect the aircraft as well. Like you might be able to pick it up on your radar, and then it just assumes that the other aircraft's pretty much gonna do what it's gonna do, but it's gonna have more uncertainty associated with it, so you're gonna maneuver a lot further away than you would with a, a cooperative aircraft that you're trying to avoid. So it's, it can do both. Okay, gotcha. So at least we do follow the laws of robotics, though. So make sure you keep the pilot <laughs> safe, go with that. It's so. funny how much I've actually seen the laws of robotics that come up in conferences. <laughs> That's how, amazing, though. Yeah, how do you, how do you, what are the, these for automated systems, you know, what are these laws and how do you encode them for safety? The systems. That makes sense. And um, the only other question I had that in terms of kind of the technical work uh, with the auto GCAS, um, you mentioned that after it does the 5G pull, uh, saves a pilot from hitting the uh, hitting the ground. How long will it coast if they, let's say they blacked out? Like, will they, I don't know really how long it takes for them to wake up. Will mm -hmm. it just wait until they take manual control again or? So I think theoretically it might just keep bouncing them up. But part of the reason that they picked a 5G pull is that it's aggressive enough to get you out of the way, but it's not so aggressive that it would cause a pilot to pass out, or that someone couldn't recover okay. during that. During that, so that's kind of why they picked the, the the 5G in the first place. So, yeah, I think I think it would probably 
theoretically, like I said, keep going. That makes sense. And I'm kind of branching off from there then. Um, so you mentioned you did a lot of work from 2011 to 2014 with these systems. Um, what's some of the stuff you're doing now outside of your PhD work uh, here on the base? So here on the base, so part of my research is doing kind of the 6-1 basic research where I am looking at verification and validation technologies for uh, autonomous and complex system control. So it's a lot of uh, research and can we do proofs? How do we design architectures of systems? So how do we lay out all different components and how they communicate and talk to each other in a way that's secure? How do we break down the analysis? One of the big problems that we have right now is when it comes to testing things, testing is extremely expensive, like tens of thousands of dollars an hour, and you can't test everything. So how do we do more upfront so we could maybe, you know, part of it's gonna be actually doing proofs on the control system from my perspective. Part of it is going to be developing different simulation techniques, developing different ways to analyze the system, and developing different ways to decide what test points are we actually going to look at, and, and really using tests almost to validate the analysis. I mean, testing is still gonna be there, but we can't scale it to test everything that we need to for an autonomous system, every possible scenario, so how do we do this better? And to bring it up a little, uh, mm -hmm. some of the work you're doing is related to space junk, and yeah, so, so, so part of it, and this is a part of the motivation for the, the, the research topic that I'm doing for my PhD, I think from the Air Force perspective, we're more worried about there's going to be a lot of space junk in low Earth orbit that we're going to have to get through to get to our assets that are further out. But there is this, this growing problem of having space junk up there. Uh, so I think there's like 23,000 or so objects that are larger than 10 centimeters in size. A lot of them are space junk that are mostly in a low Earth orbit, which is also where like the International Space Station is. So since 1999, the, the space station's had to maneuver 25 times to avoid hitting another object. And in, it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens in the next decade or so, because there's a lot of companies out there that are proposing these large constellations of, you know, a thousand or more, you know, up to 4,000, 5,000 or more satellites that are gonna be in these small bands of space. And when it comes to, you know, a car collision or an air collision, while they're really terrible, at least the debris kind of stays in one spot and you can go clean it up and, and get rid of it. Whereas you've got in, in orbit, this debris stays up there forever. I mean, if it's low enough, it will degrade. Some of it will take decades, some, some will take years, some will take decades, some take much longer than that. And a lot of these components are moving, you know, like sometimes 20 times faster than a speeding bullet. So trying to go up and clean that up is a problem. So the first, the first thing you want to do is to prevent more objects from colliding. And so that's where the idea that a collision avoidance system would be a high priority to add to future capabilities. Right, yeah, work on the, the source of the problem, not just cleaning it up. Not just cleaning it up. I think cleaning it up is going to be a challenge, but I think the more immediate need is to make sure that we don't create more debris. And that's something I, I've always wondered, and I don't know if our ooh, fans will as well, um, but when let's say we're doing a standard like launch to bring supplies up to the uh, International Space Station, it, is that lower than a lot of these satellites are going to be? So it's no danger there. Like you don't have to calculate getting around this debris, or is that still something they need to pay attention to to, to ensure no um, collision happens? Uh, so I think it's something that they still pay attention to, and I think it would probably it would probably be better if I was going to talk about just the difference between low Earth orbit and everything to do that kind of in a follow up, but. I think, like, like I said, for us, for the Air Force's concern is most of our stuff are out at geo orbit. So it's basically orbiting at the same rate that kind of the Earth's turning. Okay. So they're out at that altitude. And so in order to get out to there, you would have to go through kind of all of these different orbits and so plan a trajectory where we are going to avoid that. And then I guess, too, if you, if you had a satellite that was going to be closer, there are different altitude bands that you could put it at that are going to be less congested than others. And so you might pick that. But depending on what properties you want to do, if, how often you want to, to fly over the same area of Earth or whatever it happens to be, maybe a, a lot of competition for different altitudes. And then there might be some that have a lot more debris in them that you have to consider avoiding. Okay, so there is a level of, like, you know, there's safe bands we can fly through that are mm -hmm. clearly monitored so it's mm -hmm. not just space stuff flying everywhere. Yeah, it's pretty well monitored, and they're, they're working on technology to be able to monitor more in smaller pieces. Okay. And then a lot of uh, satellites are also designed to be able to take a certain amount of impact from smaller satellites. Or there's also micrometeoroids that are coming through that they have to protect against as well. But some of these larger pieces of debris, like the 10 centimeters, could, could take out 
your satellite's capabilities, so. That makes sense, yeah. yeah. It always seemed like an interesting dance up there in space. I wasn't sure how it all linked together, but mm -hmm. that makes a lot more sense. So we've learned a lot about what you do and kind of the path you're on. Um, a few other questions we have are, is there any, um, any one that really inspires you um, in your, your career path? So that's a great question, and I kind of struggle with that because for, for one person, because I think everywhere that I've worked, people have been so passionate, even from school. You know, when I did my undergrad at Embry-Riddle to being at AFIT, to Georgia Tech, and in here uh, at AFRL and the time that I spent at NASA, everyone that I work with is just very passionate about what they're doing. They're all here because kind of this is what they're their life's calling is, as I feel like I'm around these people who, it's not like they're, they're not coming to work and, and punching the clock. They're here because there's something that's important that they need to be working on. And, and so that, that leaves me inspired as well. And working kind of along those lines then, so this kind of links a few things we've discussed in terms of um, your career and interests. Um, going back to uh, Instagram and a lot of things you post on your work, um, I know at your desk you have quite a few STEM Barbies. So I wasn't <laughs> sure how that all began or like where uh, the collection kind of started. I don't know if that was an inspiration for you or kind of something similar to what you touched on. Uh, so that actually kind of started as a joke. So my dad asked me what I wanted for Christmas, and I told him rocket science Barbie. Uh, actually, I actually think I told him astronaut Barbie. And I didn't even know if there was such a thing. It was kind of, you know, here I am in college asking for a Barbie, and it just, it just seemed, it, it struck me funny. But it, sure enough, he went out and found it, that there was a 1994 astronaut Barbie for the, like, the 25th anniversary of Apollo. Oh, wow. It comes with a, her own bag of moon rocks. Mm -hmm. And then um, they had one in the 80s, too, so he got me those. And then it just kind of went from there where most of them became gifts. So I got like the different military services. And then as I started, you know, putting, I put them on my desk at NASA and I put them on my desk here at AFRL as well. And, and then it became, as, as new ones came out, people kept emailing me. Um, <laughs> so when in 1999, there, or not 1999, 2009, yeah. there was a uh, remake of the 60s astronaut Barbie that came out. And her, she actually has a bubble next to her head that says, yes, I am a rocket scientist, which is pretty cool. So I had a bunch of people emailing me, oh, you have to get this. So some of the other cool ones that have come out recently is in 2013, they had a Mars Explorer well, Barbie, cool. which is pretty cool. They've been doing better with this, too. Uh, there was a, what was one of the other, oh, uh, there was a computer engineer Barbie that I also have on my desk. And they actually, can, Mattel actually consulted with Society of Women Engineers. And so she's, I think, one of the better representations. You know, she's actually wearing some practical things and she has you know, serious technical stuff. Whereas there's been some other ones I'm like, I don't know. I don't know that, uh, that you'd be seeing high heels in the lab with scientists, Barbie, <laughs> right? But, but they've had some really cool ones come out in the, the past year too. They uh, had Katherine Johnson who was featured in Hidden Figures. So there's a Barbie for her now, as well as Amelia Earhart, so those are on my desk too. And I've got all the military services, boot camp Barbie. I think the most the most recent one that I added was this year. They made a robotics engineer Barbie, which is pretty cool. She even comes with a little miniature robot that they actually, it's very similar to one that they're using in a lot of university labs around the country right now. So pretty cool. I, I, I find them kind of inspiring because it's this idea that that Barbie has, and Barbie's very polarizing, but one of the mottos is, you know, we girls can do anything. And I think that that's very true, is that I can come in, I can I can have a pink water bottle, and I can, you know, have all my, my brightly colored accessories and be extremely competent at my job. Absolutely, and someday you could be that action figure of the, <laughs> the woman that went to Mars as a rocket scientist <laughs> with the Air Force. Maybe, um, but we'll see. <laughs> and then uh, something we're hoping to ask kind of everyone that Visits, uh, visits us on the podcast is you talked about all the uh, inspiring men and women that you work with throughout your career. So what is your favorite Air Force invention that those men and women have brought to the world? So I think one of the things I find most inspiring is the X-Planes program. And so the Air Force has worked with NASA and I think even Navy has been in part, part of it, but the past since the 40s, we've been building these X-planes that really advance the, the basic knowledge of what we can do. We, we break the sound barrier, these other things. And so my favorite is probably the X-15. It was this manned hypersonic aircraft uh, that a lot of the pilots got their astronaut wings. It developed a lot of technology that went into things like the space shuttle down the line. And uh, Neil Armstrong was one of the people who piloted it. But it's just, that was kind of like, that's my, my X-plane. Uh, and I remember when I first moved here and went to the to the Air Force Museum and saw it in there, 
I actually kind of got chills because it's like, here's this thing that I've watched these documentaries, I've read all these things about, and it's just this really cool piece of engineering. And, and there it is right in front of you. So that that's probably my favorite invention, but it's hard to kind of really pick one. And that's something um, I'm interested since you touched on it. Since we're so close to the Air Force Museum here, it's literally like connected. Um, do you ever go there for inspiration or if you just need to kind of zen out just to stare at old technologies <laughs> and just kind of be like, yeah, I'm, I'm building on the shoulders of these giants from here and like expanding what the Air Force has done? More I go just whenever anybody comes to visit, right? But I definitely went there. Uh, I spent more than, you know, several full days at the Air Force Museum walking around and seeing seeing everything. Uh, I think most often I go when somebody comes to visit and they want a, a rocket scientist to give them a tour of the, the, the Air Force Museum. That makes sense. Yeah. So Carrie Ann, we really want to thank you for your time. We've learned a lot about rocket science, um, Barbies. Yeah, Barbies, the Laws Robotics, had no idea you guys actually brought that up, which is super cool. <laughs> so. I mean, part of it is a joke. You know, but it's, it's, but it's like, sparks that conversation of what are these rules, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, it was awesome having you out here. So um, I think the last thing for us then is just, uh, is there anything that um, you want the fans to know or any like uh, inspirational advice you can give people trying to go down the same career path as yours? Um, I think what I would tell people is that make sure that whatever you decide to pursue, that you're really passionate about it. So don't become an engineer because you think you know, you're gonna make a lot of money or something. And don't go into a specific type of engineering because you've heard it's easier, it's more, people are more successful, or there's more of them, there's more jobs. Go into the one that you're passionate about. And don't let things like money especially stop you because there's a lot of assistance out there from graduate assistantships and, and school. There's a lot of support for STEM types of degrees and scholarships. And if it's something you're passionate about, then you're gonna you're gonna enjoy coming to work, and you're gonna feel that inspiration every day. And maybe you'll be the coworker that's inspiring everybody else because you're so excited about what you're doing. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks for joining us today. If you'd like to hear more about what our scientists and engineers are working on at the Air Force Research Laboratory, check us out on social media: Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at AF Research Lab. And stay curious, friends. Logging off. <laughs>